Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionist, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our microbiology and infectious diseases playlist. In the last video, we talked about the diseases caused by Staphylococcus aureus. Today, I'll teach you how to diagnose and treat Staph aureus diseases. With that said, now let's get started. In video number one in this playlist, we had an introduction. Then we talked about the gram stain technique. We talked about the gram positives next. And then characteristics of Staph aureus. Diseases caused by Staph aureus. And today, how to diagnose and treat Staph aureus. This is how we link microbiology with internal medicine, with labs and diagnostics. Integration, baby. But before we start, let's answer the questions of the previous video. Question one. Why is Staph aureus more likely to cause an abscess on the skin rather than in the vaginal canal? It's easy. While it's true that Staph can grow on aerobic and anaerobic media, Staph prefers the aerobic. There is more air available on your skin surface as compared to deep into the recesses of the vaginal canal. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, the vaginal canal is more acidic than your skin surface. So it's harder for Staph aureus to grow there. So the answer to question one is twofold. Number one, the vaginal canal is less aerobic. Number two, the vaginal canal is more acidic. Question number two. Remember my tampon wearing menstruating female neurosurgeon who succumbed to her illness? What was the most likely cause of her death? Oh, I know medicosis as she had uh, toxic shock syndrome. True, but what's the cause of death? Well, let me tell you. Toxic shock syndrome toxin 1 will stimulate a cytokine storm release, which means the epithelium of my vessel will start to become leaky. Cytokines will leave the vaginal canal. They will go to the systemic circulation, causing toxemia. If this is too much, I have shock. What kind of shock? Hypovolemic. But no one stabbed her. She was not involved in a car accident. Yes, but all the blood left her vessels, decreasing her effective arterial blood volume. This is the volume that perfuses tissue, and that's why I have hypovolemic shock, which ends up in decreased tissue perfusion and multi-organ failure. If you want to be a great student, after watching this video, Open an internal medicine textbook and study the topic of hypovolemic shock. Now to today's video. As you know, microbes are bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites. When it comes to bacteria, we divide bacteria into gram-positive and gram-negative based on the gram stain. Staph aureus is a gram-positive coccus. Staph aureus is a gram-positive coccus that happens to be catalase-positive, coagulase-positive. All the bacteria in this slide are gram-positive, spherical, aka cocci, lacking endospores. Let's review the characteristics of Staph aureus from Picmonic. Staph aureus is a gram-positive, here's the angel, coccus, cocked eyes, spherical eyes, catalase positive, positive cat, coagulase positive, positive clogs, beta hemolytic, here's the beta fish, protein A is a virulence factor, a for apple, which inhibits phagocytosis. Many Staph aureus are sensitive, but they are getting increasingly resistant. The nasty MRSA. Why is MRSA resistant? Because it has altered its response to penicillin. What does that mean? Normally, penicillin binds to penicillin binding proteins on the surface of the bacteria. This has been altered. Penicillin can no longer bind. Next, let's review the diseases caused by Staph aureus. Staph aureus can lead to skin infections, including impetigo. It can lead to abscesses. It can cause endocarditis and pneumonia and osteomyelitis. Then let's talk about the toxins. I can get Staph's scalded skin syndrome by the exfoliative toxin. I can get Staph food poisoning by the enterotoxin. I can get toxic shock syndrome by toxic shock syndrome 1 toxin, which binds MHC2 and the T cell receptor, especially the CD4 T cell, activating the lymphocytes and causing a crazy immunological reaction. Now let's diagnose Staph aureus. Microscopy, culture, nucleic acid amplification test, DNA test, identification and antibody detection. Pause and review. Let's add some visual cues. Pause and review. 
Microscopy. How can I use this to diagnose staph? You take a sample. For example, if I have an abscess on my skin, take a sample from that abscess. Send it to the lab. The lab will examine it under the microscope after staining it via the gram stain. The technique of the gram stain was discussed in video number two. What will I see under the microscope? Lovely, beautiful, gram positive, i.e. purple, cocci in clusters. Oh, that makes sense. So can I examine the sample obtained from the skin using microscopy? Yes, you can. Can I examine a sample obtained from the blood, i.e. blood sample, just to see the bacteria there? No, you cannot. Why not? Because even if I have bacteremia caused by staph right now, the concentration of staph aureus in my blood will be less than one bacterium per ml of blood. It's not enough to diagnose it under the microscope. Therefore, what should I do then? Culture the blood. Provide the bacteria with a nourishing medium so the bacteria can grow and multiply. And instead of one cell, you will have gazillion cells and you will see them beautifully on the culture. Tell me about the culture of medicosis. Well, we use nutritionally enriched agar medium. Okay, you can supplement this with sheep blood. Remember that Staph aureus is beta hemolytic, by the way. And then Staph aureus is gonna grow. By the way, Staph aureus can grow on selective media or non-selective media. Non-selective medium is the most basic, just like this. How about selective media? Well, you can try the mannitol salt agar. Why did I add mannitol? Because Staph aureus can ferment it. Okay, and this will tell you that what's here on the plate is Staph aureus. But hey, medicosis, uh, this could be cross-contaminated by other bacteria that are not Staph aureus, and I will get false results. Don't worry, add 7.5% sodium chloride solution. This will kill most of the other organism, leaving Staph aureus alone on the Petri dish. And this will help you pick Staph aureus if it's there. So Staph aureus can grow on selective and non-selective media, aerobic or anaerobic media. Usually at room temperature, Staph aureus grow rapidly on culture. The results will be available in less than 24 hours. And when they grow, what do they give you? Yellow colonies. Yeah, yellow. That's why we call them Staph aureus, the golden bacteria. Oh, yellow golden colonies. Next, you can try nucleic acid amplification test. Take the nucleic acid from the bacterial cell and amplify it so that you have gazillions of them. The results of this test is available super fast in less than three hours by recognizing the genetic material of the Staph aureus. Next, identification. What the flip is that? Biochemistry tests. All right, what are we trying to find? I'm trying to find coagulase because you know Staph aureus is coagulase positive. But the other staphs are coagulase negative. Example, staph epidermidis, staph saprophyticus, they are coagulase negative. How can I distinguish among staph aureus, staph saprophyticus, and staph epidermidis? Well, let's do the coagulase test. If it's positive, you know it's staph aureus. If it's negative, it's the other doofuses. Okay, how can I perform the coagulase test? Add the patient's plasma in a test tube, and then add staph aureus bacteria onto the test tube. As you know, Staph aureus has what? Coagulase, which will do what? Coagulate the blood. If the blood clots, you have your positive tube coagulase test, and bingo, this is Staph aureus, and this is not Staph epidermidis, this is not Staph saprophyticus. What else? You can run biochemical tests to find protein A, which is one of the virulence factors of Staph aureus. You can find the Staph nuclease, and by adding mannitol, it helps us recognize and identify this Staph aureus because it ferments mannitol. Last, antibody detection. What's that? Your antibodies against the bacteria. Which part of the bacteria? The cell wall of the bacteria. Which part of the cell wall of the bacteria? The tachoic acid. This was how to diagnose Staph aureus infection. Please pause and review. Now to treatment. First of all, you know that food poisoning caused by staph is self-limiting, just supportive care. Watchful waiting. Should I give antibiotics? Shut up. Food poisoning is caused by a toxin, not by staph itself. Antibiotics are anti-bio, are anti-living organism. The toxin is not a living organism. Antibiotics do not work against toxins. 
The food poisoning of staph is caused by the toxin of staph. So do not give antibiotics. How about impetigo? Well, it depends. Is it bullous impetigo or non-bullous impetigo? Bullous impetigo is only caused by staph. Staph aureus only. How about streptococcus? No, only staph. How do I treat it? Yeah, topical and systemic, right? No, only systemic. Bullous impetigo is severe. It's only caused by staph, only treated systemically by systemic antibiotics. Example is oral cephalexin, which is a first generation cephalosporins. How about non-bullous impetigo? Usually less severe. Staph or strept? Mild or severe? Mild, topically, severe, systemically. How do I treat it topically? Topical mepiracin, which is a topical antibiotic ointment. How about systemic antibiotics? Same stinking oral cephalexin, which is a first generation cephalosporin. Cephalosporins are cell wall synthesis inhibitor. They inhibit the synthesis of the peptidoglycan cell wall of the stinking staph aureus. Hey, medicosis, my patient has a skin abscess. Well, depends on how bad the abscess is. This is how it's treated. Incision and drainage, this is routine. If it's so bad, you add antibiotics. If it's super bad, reaching the blood, causing bacteremia, intravenous antibiotics. So management of an abscess depends on the clinical scenarios. These are the broad rules. How about treating MRSA? Let me tell you a great story. In the beginning, Staph aureus was sensitive to methicillin. Awesome. What's methicillin? One of the penicillins. All right. Why was methicillin revolutionary at that period in time? Because it was resistant to the bacterial beta-lactamase. Anytime the Staph aureus tried to secrete the enzyme beta-lactamase to destroy my beta-lactam antibodies, methicillin proudly said no. You will not divide us. You will not destroy me. I am resistant to your beta-lactamase bacteria. And methicillin kicked Staph aureus in the gluteus maximus. And that's why Staph aureus then was called what? Methicillin sensitive Staph aureus. What the flip does that mean? Staph aureus that can be killed by methicillin. It is sensitive to it. Then a bad thing happened. We discovered that methicillin has horrible side effects. One of them is toxicity to the kidney by means of interstitial nephritis. So we stopped using methicillin. But hey, medicosis, how are we supposed to treat this methicillin sensitive Staph aureus then? Use methicillin alternatives, which include ox, clox, diclox, and naph. Why? Because you're trying to treat staph. For staph, use ox, clox, diclox, and naph. Oxicillin, cloxicillin, dicloxicillin, naficillin. Okay, medicosis, everything is hunky-dory. But wait, the staph aureus became resistant to the methicillin and the methicillin alternatives, which include ox, clox, dicloxin, and nav. So MRSA is, by definition, resistant to ox, clox, dicloxin, and nav. So don't say, oh, the patient has MRSA, let me give oxicillin. Shut up, it is MRSA. The name has the answer. The name tells you that it is resistant to methicillin and the entire methicillin family. So don't give any of these. What should I do then? Give vancomycin to kill the MRSA. Oh, that's awesome. But wait, it got worse. Staph developed resistance against vancomycin. And now we will call it vancomycin resistant Staph aureus. Stupid stinking bacteria. What a bunch of communists. How can I treat Versa then? Do not give vancomycin. What should I do? Give linezolid or daptomycin. Who's daptomycin? Uh, the cousin of vancomycin. Or telavancin or ciftaroline, which is a fifth generation cephalosporin. So how do I treat MRSA? Well, you have many choices. You can give oral medications or intravenous medications. The king of intravenous medications is vancomycin. Who's vancomycin's cousin? Daptomycin. Who's very good but very expensive? Linezolid. You can also give tiger cyclin, which is one of the tetracyclines. Oh, by the way, there is a difference between tetracyclines and tetracycline. Tetracyclines is a class of medications that include many things, including doxycycline, tiger cyclin, minocycline, etc. But tetracycline is an individual medication which is also a member of the tetracyclines family. How about some oral options? Use one of the tetracyclines, such as doxycycline, for example, 
clindamycin, linezolid, very good but very expensive, and you can try TMP SMX. How can I memorize this medicosis? Easy. Doxy with clinda. Why? Because doxycycline, clindamycin, they rhyme together. That was oral. For IV, vancomycin, daptomycin, they are cousins. All right. And then number three is always lenizolid. Very good, but very expensive. And then you have a fourth alternative. If you're talking oral, TMP, SMX. Be aware of sulfa drug allergy. If it's intravenous, it's tiger cycling. So up to the left, I started with a tetracycline. Down to the right, I ended with another tetracycline. But what if it's not MRSA? What if it's MSSA? The sensitive one. Easy. Give ox, clox, diclox, and naph because they are methicillin sensitive. But we don't give methicillin anymore. We give one of his brothers ox, clox, diclox, or naph for staph. Do you remember when we talked about staph versus trapped, coagulase positive versus coagulase negative, localized, limited, confined infection versus the infection that spreads? Folliculitis, abscess, furuncle, carbuncle versus sepsis, cellulitis, necrotizing, fasciitis, and sometimes erysipelas? Yeah. How do we treat staph? Don't forget to incise and drain the abscess and you give antibiotics. If it's methicillin sensitive, don't give methicillin. Give one of the family. Ox, clox, diclox, or naficillin. How about if it's MRSA? Vancomycin or clindamycin? How it's versa? Don't give vanco, give linezolid or streptogramins. Hey medicosis, my patient has a skin abscess. Where should I get the sample from? Uh, from the skin. Which part of the skin? Get as deep as you can from the base of the lesion. Why? The base has more necrosis and there are more bacteria living there. Do not just give me a superficial aspiration from the surface. This will give me relatively few bacteria, increasing the risk of a false negative test result. The base has more bacteria, but superficialis sucks. Why is MRSA resistant? Because of MEK-A gene. Why is VERSA resistant? Because of VAN-A. In a nutshell, virulence factors of Staph aureus are here, Staph aureus diseases are here, diagnosis is by microscopy, culture, nucleic acid amplification test, identification, and antibody detection. How do I treat it? If it's Staph aureus food poisoning, it's self-limiting. If it's sensitive, ox, clox, diclox, and naph. If it's MRSA, give vancomycin or linezolid. If it's versa, give linezolid. If you want to understand the different types of penicillins, the different types of cephalosporins, when to use them, when not to use them, check out my antibiotics course. It comes with 40 videos available to download on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. I also have a toxicology course on my website. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.